Good afternoon. Welcome back to UCSF Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the UCSF Department of Medicine. Welcome to our live audience in our department and throughout UCSF and the UCSF Health Network. Uh, we will post this video as usual at about 7.30 tonight on YouTube and I will tweet out the address. And uh, we're now over 600,000 visits to, uh, to this series. A few quick ground rules are here on the screen. Uh, the same as usual, uh, put your screen in, uh, in, in full screen mode. And if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, this week, we have a single guest, uh, Dr. Ashish Jha. Ashish is professor at Harvard University, director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, and senior associate dean for research translation and global strategy at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. He's also a practicing internist. Uh, I believe quite strongly that Ashish is the nation's leading expert in evidence-based healthcare policy, particularly as it relates to cost and quality of care. Uh, he's also an expert in global health, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, he's become one of the most visible experts in the world in communicating with the public and the profession about the policy response to COVID-19 and about the emerging evidence. Next month, he will become Dean of the Brown University School of Public Health. I wanted to have Ashish on, uh, in part because I think he's done an extraordinary job communicating with the public and the profession about really complicated topics that change all the time, uh, combining his deep knowledge of healthcare, economics, policy, clinical medicine, uh, and doing it, delivering it in a way that's highly accessible uh, along with uh, thoughtful advocacy. Uh, and so uh, let me see, I don't see Ashish's video. Let me be sure that is on. There we go. There. Welcome. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Thank you. So I, before we start, I gave most of your resume, but I neglected the most important part, uh, which uh, was that Ashish was a medicine resident at UCSF uh, and chief resident at our VA hospital from 2000 to 2001, uh, along with Hal Collard, who was his co-chief resident. Uh, for those of you at the VA, if you look up on the wall, you will see uh, this uh, group of uh, photographs of former chief residents from the VA and Ashish and Hal's picture is actually the first in line uh, it should be noted that I was chief resident at the VA as well, but that was before they invented photography. So my picture is not up there. So before we dive into the topic of COVID, Ashish, uh, we have a lot of UCSF residents and, and students watching, and you've been incredibly generous as you've talked about your time at UCSF. Can you just say a word about what your time with us meant to you and your career? Yeah. No, it, Bob, it, it was transformative. And, and uh, I remember showing up um, feeling uh, completely ill-prepared for becoming a doctor. I mean, we all technically come in with an MD as an intern, but I think we all know that we don't really uh, know how to practice medicine. And I don't remember who it was, but it was one of the program directors who said a line that, that has stuck with me. It's a, I think it's a commonly used line at UCSF maybe, but at least that time, it was this line of, you know, if we can turn mold into penicillin, we can turn you all into doctors. Yep. And that gave me comfort. Like, you're right. I, I, hey, uh, maybe I can be better than mold in terms of uh, how this all plays out. But, but in all seriousness, um, it was an extraordinary time to learn clinical medicine. Um, what was really interesting was it was 1997. And as an intern, I saw in, uh, at, at the county, at San Francisco General, you know, all of these people with uh, pneumocystis pneumonia and with advanced HIV. And by the time I was a chief resident, 2001, I don't think I saw a single one anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was that fast that this disease, which had sort of so overshadowed what had happened in medicine over a 20 year period and has shaped global health since then. I think HIV was the, certainly the most important and transformational disease for um, global health for a long time. Uh, COVID probably will be as we think about the future. Um, that the sort of the beginning of the end happened while I was a resident. And that was, that I think was very transformative. And then just incredible mentorship um, from Talmadge King uh, to uh, you, Bob, uh, Paul Volberding, who was my chair at, uh, at the VA. Uh, it was just an extraordinary experience. So I have always not only looked back at that fondly, but it's funny because I've now been at, at Harvard and I left in 2002, so 18 years. And when I practice medicine around here, I still feel like I'm sort of the outsider because mm -hmm. I learned medicine at, in San Francisco at UCSF and, and it's, um, so it's an extraordinary place and I miss it. Great, uh, thank still. you. 
been a wonderful ambassador and, and we, are, we are proud of you. Um, let's talk about communication in the pandemic. I, you know, maybe you and Scott Gottlieb have been the most visible public figures, um, maybe Andy Slavitt as well, in terms of the, being on the media and all the talk shows. Uh, it probably is harder than it looks. You make it look easy, but tell me about the stresses of it, how you prepare for an interview, what you worry about, you know, if you screw up, what's that going to look like? How do you even think about this? Yeah, it's, it's a very surreal experience in the sense that, you know, before March, I did the occasional interview, had a paper come out, uh, did a TV interview, did some media, and felt reasonably comfortable speaking to journalists. Um, wasn't necessarily scary, but I was speaking about things I knew, I knew intimately, right? So if somebody was going to call me about a paper of ours that, was, that had come out, ask me any question you want about methods, ask me about why we did it, ask me about what it means. I knew it inside out because, of course, when you write a paper, you've spent months or sometimes years with that paper and you know it. And I found myself all of a sudden in early March uh, talking about this pandemic. Uh, and initially it began with a couple of uh, interviews where I was pretty critical of the administration's response. And I think it was early March and people didn't really have a good sense of what had just happened, that we had wasted this incredible period of time between mid-January and early March, not getting ready. And we were about to hit, get hit with a wall and, uh, of infections. And of course, we all know how it played out. And it, it, so the beginning was sort of slow going and I, so I used to prepare a lot. I worried a lot about trying to get my tone right. But over time, Bob, in some ways, it, it, you know, as it started kind of evolving, I started getting, at one point I was probably getting 100 media requests a day, uh, was doing 20 to 25. And actually just as a side point, I have, um, because we have a team of people who track it, I've averaged about 15 to 17 media, media hits a day since March 5th. And it's still only like a, you know, but what it has meant is a couple of things. First is my, my single biggest goal is not to spread misinformation, right? So don't get stuff wrong. And that means that like we, I know what topics they're generally gonna ask me about. By the way, sometimes they will spring a, a question that I wasn't expecting or a topic I wasn't expecting and that's okay. Um, but the single biggest thing is like read about it and learn about it. And I found that in the early days, I had to take extra effort and time to make sure that I was reasonably well-versed. Um, we can talk more about how you stay within kind of in your area of expertise. Um, th these days I've done enough that I don't do a whole lot of preparation. I have a sense of where they wanna go. I have a sense of where the national conversation is. Uh, and I know on kind of what grounds I'm willing to talk and on what grounds I'm not. And so if I get asked something way outside, I will, I will bring it into where I wanna be. But also there's a bit of a dance with journalists where they know what questions I'm likely to not get into. So occasionally Chris Cuomo will try to, you know, get me into talking about uh, something that's deeply political and I'm not gonna go there. Because uh, I don't find it to be useful for me to pontificate on the election, for instance. So well, why not? What uh, you have to draw a line because this whole thing has become deeply political. You already mentioned that you haven't been happy with the overall response, which is really a political question. So how do you draw that line of where it is too political? I, I try to think about where, where, and how do I be constructive? And and, um, and sometimes we we politicize things more than they are necessary. So I'll give you an example. Um, as we got into late March into early April, um, you could see different states really having very, very different responses. Obviously that continues to this day. And often when I would go on certain television networks, their producers would call me and say, we wanna, the storyline here is blue states are doing a great job and, and red states are really screwing up. And uh, so that's gonna be the storyline, are you comfortable? And the, and the general answer was no, I'm not comfortable with that. And the reason is because it wasn't true. Um, so Ohio, Mike DeWine, unfortunately he was just, he just got uh, diagnosed with coronavirus, but you know, he's been fabulous. He's a Republican. Larry Hogan, I think has done a good job. I think Charlie Baker's done a good job. That's three Republican governors. So I have, I have wanted to push back on simple political narratives. A, it's not true, B, it isn't helpful. And I don't think that that's how we wanna to try to move people forward. The challenge has been more to talk about the failures of government action without it being specifically about Donald Trump. Uh, and that's a little bit harder because if you're talking about federal government failures, 
uh, people will hear in their ears say, you're, what you're really saying is Donald Trump has been a failure. And, and I try to be more thoughtful about that, but that's a harder line to stick to. So let, let's talk about the politics and you, you can draw those lines any way you, you'd like, but um, just take me back to February and you hear this is coming and there may be a tsunami. You're a student of politics and policy. What did you see as the potential vulnerabilities in the US as it pertained to dealing with a potential pandemic? And what did you see as potential strengths at the time? Well, I wanna start off by getting, sharing like all the stuff I got wrong in, in January and February, because I think it plays into my own surprise in early March. So in late January, um, health affairs folks reached out to me to see if I'd write a blog about the coronavirus and what it was likely to mean both as a global outbreak, but also for the United States. And uh, if you want to look at my ability to get stuff really, really wrong, you should read that piece. Um, so I talked about primarily focus on American global leadership and why it was essential and why I worried that America had squandered some of that global uh, leadership. And then I had a whole paragraph on how the American response was going to be great, uh, that the U.S. was going to be a standout. We were going to do fine. I wasn't worried. Um, it's kind of sort of embarrassing to even say all this. <laughs> and, and, but it, it colored my view. And the reason I thought that was because um, I believed, and, and I guess some part of my brain still believes, that the CDC was the greatest public health agency in the world. And I knew the people at the CDC. And I wasn't super worried. And as I saw February unfold, I mostly couldn't believe what I was seeing and, and, was, and was convinced that I was missing something that I was seeing these debacles in testing, these little bits of data that disease was spreading in, in many parts of our country and not seeing a response from the CDC and thinking, I'm just not paying attention. It's surely happening. They surely had this all figured out. How could they not? And it was, I remember the date because I was actually in Switzerland and a, and a reporter from the United States from ProPublica called me. And in that conversation, like something in my brain just like clicked like, oh my God, we have wasted the last six weeks and have done nothing to prepare. And, and, and that, I think, I, I just, I remember very clearly where that happened. And that was the moment I realized um, I had gotten this all wrong and that things had, were probably quite bad in many parts of the country, but we had no idea. We had no testing. We had no capacity to do, or we just weren't doing the right surveillance. And, uh, and then in the next week, it just became very obvious that things and was Horribly. Was that just uh, sort of anchoring bias in a way that, that or was it just optimism and, and you, you were taking in retrospect, there were facts available to you that in your normal life, you would have said this disproves the hypothesis that we're in good shape, but you were able to discard them because of some combination of optimism or just uh, yeah. being stuck yeah. on, on your, your way of thinking? It was both probably. It was probably both optimism, anchoring bias, a strong belief in the a uh, terrific team at the CDC. And, you know, if you had said to me, who do you trust more to like get, come up with the right response, the CDC or you? I've been like the CDC, they're amazing. Like, yeah. you know, who am I? So I, it, it just, it was, it was one of those things where this institution that you grow up loving, admiring, believing in is at the heart of what you're supposed to do. It takes a lot of information for you to decide that everything you've believed about that is wrong. And um, so, yeah, it was, a comp it was all these biases uh, and optimism that I think completely blinded me for a good chunk of February. Yeah. And then yeah. at the end of February, it became obvious where we were. You've studied uh, in your prior work, and I think in this as well, health systems around the world. Uh, there's a little bit of a grass is greener thing, but the grass is probably is greener in a lot of them. Can you give us maybe the two or three main lessons you take away from the rest of the world's performance on this? On the pandemic? Yeah, on the pandemic. So the single biggest lesson, if you differentiate who's done well and who's done badly, um, it's all about how seriously you take the virus and how seriously you take the pandemic. And so if you look at a country, you know, in March or by mid-March, the country we wanted to avoid being the kind of you know, the, 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 the folks that we wanted to not be like was Italy. And so what happened in Italy was 
they didn't take it seriously for a while. The number of cases built up, the hospitalization started really climbing. And by the time they took it seriously, they had, they were, their hospitals were overwhelmed. And so that's what we wanted to avoid. Um, and if you look over and over again, that has been the differentiating factor between America and, and many other countries. And America is not monolithic, and we can come back to that. But as a, as a nation, that would be the biggest differentiating factor. And the reason is, you could say, well, you know, how about South Korea? They did a great job on testing and tracing. Germany's done well on testing, but they've actually had other set of policies that have really been really useful for them. And New Zealand's testing program is good, but they really locked down very aggressively for a long period of time. So it isn't like there's a single formula on public health response that's been useful. You can try one, any one of these things, but you got to try and do something well. And we've done a whole bunch of these things kind of half-heartedly. And that's, that's what differentiates us, I think, from these other countries. Yeah, it's a hard question. Uh, is there anything you think we've done well? Yeah. What, what's that? Yeah. So what have we done well? Um, and again, at a federal level, I certainly think um, that what we've done with vaccines and accelerating vaccines, investing in, in vaccination efforts um, has, been, has been pretty good. And the, and the evidence for that is we've got you know, a couple of well, one clinical trial in phase three, Moderna, that's really because of the U.S. government's uh, role. I think you'd ar argue that the Oxford AstraZeneca effort would have happened with or without the U.S. government, but the U.S. government's also played a whole role there. So Operation Warp Speed, not my favorite name, doesn't matter. I think so far has been executed pretty well. Um, what else has the U.S. done well? Uh, I do, again, I think NIA, uh, NIAID, sorry, not NIA, NIAID with its efforts on the remdesivir trial, like I think on some of the more biomedical stuff, which tends to be in our sweet spot anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we've generally done well. Though, you know, you could argue the National Health Service with the recovery trial, what they have pulled off is extraordinary, and we should have done stuff like that. But that's harder for us to organize in our country. Um, but I think on generally on the biomedical response, it's been pretty good. Yeah. Um, did the tension between the public health response and the economy surprise you at all? I, I think it's one of those things that feels like in retrospect, it's obvious you have to shut everything down and, uh, and there's going to become this narrative of, you know, our, which side are you on, the economy or the public health? But did, did you anticipate that at all or was that a surprise? It was, um, I, 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 when I first saw it, that argument come up, I, I, was, um, I was a little surprised because I really believed and still believe uh, that they actually align really well together. And it tells you a little bit about some of the economists that I maybe pay too much attention to. When I think about the economists that I watch and listen to, the Justin Wolfers and you know, Larry Summers and others, who I think are very, very good um, economists, their, their main point was, you want a good economic policy? Suppress the virus. And I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And that's going to be the consensus. Obviously ended up not, for a lot of the country, the conversation ended up being between, um, it, you know, do you want the economy open or do you want to suppress the virus? And, and it was unfortunate because we knew that if you let the virus run wild or just let it run a lot, as we're seeing in the South today, it has huge negative economic effects. And, you know, you can look at a country like Germany that has done a reasonably good job their unemployment rate is 6.4%. It's not great, but it's a lot better than ours. So there really is an economic benefit. But what I found frustrating is that many of us have been trying to make that argument. And to be perfectly honest, I think we have not done a good enough job. I, I don't think that that point uh, that suppressed the virus and the economy actually comes back uh, has gotten across as effectively as it should have. And I've thought a lot about what I could have done differently or better to try to make that point. But still has not gotten across as clearly. And it's even now uh, on the issue of school reopenings, this is a conversation I literally had with a Secretary of Commerce of a state two days ago, where I was telling him, pleading with him to close the bars in the state. And he said, well, the tax receipts. And I said, you know, the economic loss of having all your schools shut down this fall, I suspect will overwhelm any tax receipt losses from the bars. And he just couldn't quite believe that keeping bars open would make it harder for us to open schools. Yeah, wow. Um, before we leave the global comparison, I know you, you've studied, um, uh, you've studied India quite a bit. And uh, what's your sense of how things are going there? Yeah, you know, India's interesting because 
um, they took the virus very seriously in the beginning. I think Modi um, was very aggressive. There's a couple of tactical errors, and you could argue they're more than just tactical errors in how they dealt with immigrants, uh, uh, not immigrants, sorry, migrant workers. Uh, that really was disruptive. But but if if my if my overall hypothesis is countries do well if they take the virus seriously, which it is, you could argue that India should is has done well. They took the virus very seriously. They locked down for a very extended period of time. The problem with India is that lockdowns are fine as a temporizing measure, but they, they're really meant to buy you time to build up an alternative control mechanism. And India really didn't spend the time doing that. And, and the political communication that came out of the leadership was, once the lockdown ends, the virus, it's over. Like the pandemic will largely be done. And of course, the, the lockdown ended and the number of cases started rising. They didn't have a great testing infrastructure. Uh, people weren't wearing masks. There wasn't good communication that this was a long haul. And now India is generating a lot of cases. It's uh, depending on the day, sometimes it's number two, sometimes number three in the world. And no real sense in my mind that they're anywhere near done in terms of uh, increases. So I think India will end up having quite a few number of cases and deaths by the time this thing, whole thing is over. And I can't leave the international scene without asking about Sweden. I'm sure you get asked all the time. So what's your take on the Swedish uh, strategy for this? <laughs> what's interesting, again, the politicization of all of this is like in, in all of these conversations, like every word, every country is a code for a, a point that I am trying to make, right? So <laughs> it's just hilarious because here's the problem with all of this stuff, which is it's all complicated. Like there are no simple, easy answers. So I've had like the number of conversations I've had about Sweden and, and it's because everybody wants to use Sweden to say, and therefore America policy should be X. And so let's, mm -hmm. And, and I think, and I am glad you raised it because it's an opportunity to sort of talk about the nuance of this, right? So Sweden's initial policy was, we're not gonna shut down and they never really did shut down. And on one hand, I could point you to the deaths per capita and show you that it's been awful compared to its neighbors and declare that Sweden has been a failure. And I think that would be unfair to Sweden on the other hand, I could point you to the fact that they have very few cases now, no deaths yesterday, if I remember, and they never locked down and say that Sweden's been a success. Lockdowns don't work. And the bottom line is it's much more nuanced. So here's what we know about Sweden. Half the households in Sweden are people who live by themselves. That is not true anywhere else in the world. It's not even true in the other Scandinavian countries. That's called natural social distancing, right? Like if half the households are people living by themselves, that automatically builds in a lot of social distancing. Sweden's had very aggressive um, communication around avoiding large gatherings. And when things started really looking bad and a lot of people were dying, they really ramped that up in terms of trying to get people to act more responsibly. It is a different country. And so they have managed to find their way through this with a lot of deaths, a pretty badly beaten up economy, but now doing reasonably better and you know, what I say is Sweden had a really hard time executing on the Swedish approach. And they look like they've mostly somewhat been able to do it with a really high cost. I'm not sure any other country can do a better job on the Swedish approach than Sweden. And it, I just don't know how translatable those lessons are. Let's uh, turn to the domestic front. Um, sort of the first area that we seem to get wrong was masks. Um, with, you know, problematic messaging and then, of course, devolve very quickly into uh, you had to choose your side, shirts or skins, and you were defining who you were voting for by whether you wore a mask. What are the lessons of, what did we learn from masks? Uh, probably they may be applicable to other things that have to be done and create some level of pain or hardship or at least uh, disquiet among people who have a more libertarian, don't tell me what to do bent. So what, what should we learn from what the first four or five months of masks, uh, what does that tell us? Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you that um, one part of it is I think um, being clearer in our communication and, and expressing more uncertainty. So when I think back to late February, early March, or even late March, where we were largely not recommending that people wear masks, 
um, you know, I think I was and, and other public health people were more, um, we expressed more certainty than we had. And certainty that I, they didn't, the certainty that they didn't work, that, that we, we didn't think they, that they weren't know. helpful and people shouldn't wear them. Yep. And the reason, so it's worth understanding why did we get that communication wrong? So we didn't have much evidence that they worked. So it, it, it wouldn't have made sense to recommend people wear masks. But I think we should have had more humility and less certainty in recommending that people don't wear masks. And I think the reason we kind of conveyed a greater sense of certainty is we were very worried that people would go out and get a 95 mask and then the hospitals would not have them. And I think we should have just done a better job explaining that to people. Like we don't have any evidence that this was really helpful. And by the way, if you wanna wear a mask, please don't wear an N95 it would have been better than nobody should wear masks, right? If you're not a healthcare worker, don't wear a mask. I think we just got that part wrong. And, and has taught me a lot about trying to think about certainty and communication. And obviously as evidence shifted, people shifted, I shifted. And, and, and as the evidence has gotten stronger and stronger, it, you know, I've become more certain. And people ask me, well, if, I, if you got it wrong before, how do I know you're not getting it wrong now? And it's a fair question. And the answer is, I didn't have much evidence then. And I have much more evidence now. It's not like they're in the exact same position. We are in a different position. We've got a lot more data and evidence and, it, and, and more compelling evidence that masks are very helpful. Um, but I, I wish I and other public health people had done a better job of expressing our uncertainty in February, March, and April around masks uh, than we did. I wonder whether one of the other lessons is the challenges of behavioral change and that just political edicts may not do it, particularly in a highly politicized environment. And you know, hearing the governor tell you to do it may be less persuasive than having a someone you follow on YouTube do it. Is there, is there, are there lessons there that come from the world of public health about how you get people to do things? I'm sure from HIV as well. Absolutely. No, no, that, that's a great point. And I think that has been a really important part of this is, I've said, and I've thought about this in terms of vaccines, when we have a vaccine that's safe and uh, effective and widely available, how are we gonna encourage people to take it? And in all of this stuff, and to me, uh, it's one, th and so there are a couple of parts of this. One is, I think it's, it's particularly unhelpful to have a deeply polarizing person like Donald Trump get into public health messaging. Because whatever he says, if you're a fan of President Trump, you're like, I'm doing that. And just as importantly, if you're not a fan, you see that as what you're not going to do. And, and that, has really, that has really played out in school openings, where school openings have become way politicized. And when I have advocated for school openings in, under certain circumstances, people have literally called me a Trumpist. And I'm like, have you looked at any of my Twitter feed? Like, what part of that feels very Trumpian to you? It doesn't matter. Um, but, the, but the point is that not everything can be about political signaling. And the moment presidents wade into public health things, it becomes a, a deeply political issue. If you really want people to change behavior, you've got to both model it uh, and you've got to have trusted voices. And, and, and that sometimes they can come from the top. I wish the president didn't talk about it and just wore the mask. I think that would make a big difference. Um, and, uh, but I think local leaders, mayors, governors, governors have been incredibly trusted in this outbreak. I mean, uh, not all of them, but a majority of them or many of them have sky high uh, approval ratings. And when they do, if they advocate for something, I think that's helpful. But I wanted, I've wanted to see civil leaders and you know, um, civil society leaders uh, do a lot of this advocacy, religious leaders in a lot of parts of the country. That, that's much more useful than the governor you may or may not like or the president you may or may not like. What, what does the history of public health tell us about coercion to do things like mass? Should people be fined, arrested? You can, you, know, you can imagine worlds and probably other countries where the response is, we're not gonna to try to influence you. We are going to make it mandatory. And if you don't do it, bad stuff's gonna to happen to you. What, does that work or not work? You know, so, um, so what I wanna say because there's both the civil libertarian and the public health person in me wants to say it doesn't work. But I don't know that I can say that. I still don't wanna do it by the way, so I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at China and what did China do when it really clamped down? Essentially it was an authoritarian state and they made it incredibly hard for people to leave their homes. Uh, you couldn't just go out for a walk uh, when Wuhan shut down. 
and it worked. So the point is authoritarianism can work in an authoritarian state. Uh, we all want to wish that we could say in public health that doesn't work. But, but the point is we don't live in an authoritarian state. I don't want to live in an authoritarian state. And I don't want that to be the tool that we use. I generally tend to think the sort of super punitive stuff like arresting people, not useful. Um, but then the question is, how are you going to enforce masks? And if the end, we've seen videos of people walking into stores and refusing. Um, and I think, my, first of all, like, and there are a lot of people working on this. Uh, for some chunk of people, it is about education, offering them a mask. There are a lot of a lot of states where police carry around extra masks and when they're called, the first thing they do is they show up and they offer a mask and, and some chunk of people decide they're going to de-escalate and wear the mask and, uh, and it gets better. You probably need to have some amount of, of, of punitive, I'm fine with fines, uh, arresting people and putting them in jail for not wearing a mask like feels really draconian to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to find our way through it. But majority of people, I think, are, are pretty open to complying with these things if you'd make it seem reasonable and, and about you know, trying to do the right thing for everybody. When else. you heard uh, Delta Airlines tossing people off the plane for not wearing masks and putting them on the do not fly Delta list, were you, were you good with that? I think taking them off the plane, if they refuse to wear a mask on the plane, pulling back and taking them off the plane strikes me as completely reasonable. It's respectful to everybody else on the plane. You know, do not fly Delta. Um, I, I want to give people a chance to correct, right? I want to give people a chance to show up the next time and with the mask and be able to fly. Um, and you know, and I, I guess if they do it again, I mean, there's a huge financial cost to having to bring the plane back. I get it. Um, so, you know, huge financial cost if all of if everyone else says I'm not flying Delta because people aren't wearing masks. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I was saying that also a huge financial cost to Delta if people choose not to fly Delta because I'm not guaranteed that everybody in the plane is going to be wearing a mask. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a place where I actually have, and I've talked about this and have, have spoken out about this in a few different instances. Like I think airlines just have to enforce an all mask rule. Like I just think um, that's, that's the part of doing business. Like I don't get to light up a cigarette on sitting in my seat, right? Like I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, and if I did, there would be a fine or there'd be issues with that. In the same way, you shouldn't be able to sit in and, and not wear a mask unless there's some very compelling. I would, you would think that it's more dangerous for someone not to be wearing a mask than someone not to have their seat upright. Correct. <laughs> and yet it's, it's not an FAA regulation. Yeah. Uh, let's turn to, to testing. Um, and in, in some ways, that's been the drum that you've been banging the loudest. Uh, from early on, I think maybe even before a lot of other people were. So what was it about testing that struck you as being so central to the response? Yeah, you know, I guess I um, found myself, and this is really end of February, um, starting to see little bits of data um, that the disease was much more widespread in places like New York and, and Washington and, and maybe even elsewhere than we thought. And yet we had no ability to really get a sense of it because there's just no testing capacity. And it really was about public health 101. Like the entire strategy on dealing with infectious diseases where people spread to others is you identify who's infected and you separate them from people who are not infected, right? So that's the entire strategy. And you know how draconian that is and how you do it and how aggressively, those are the subtleties. But principle number one is you take infected people and you keep them away from uninfected people. Um, we couldn't do that if you couldn't test people and identify. So then if you can't, then there are broader universal precautions you can do. Uh, but the idea of testing as sort of, you know, num point number one in whatever else you're going to do has always been at the, at the uh, been a cornerstone of public health. And the fact that we could not generate a simple diagnostic PCR test, and PCR technology has been around, for what, 25, 30 years? Like the technology isn't cutting edge. Uh, the fact that we couldn't generate that just struck me as, well, so what's interesting, Bob, is it struck me as both incredibly problematic and confusing. Like it didn't make sense to me that we couldn't do this. And it struck me that there was something else going on. And I think over time I have come to realize a lot more was going on. It wasn't just a simple uh, technical failure. And there really was a huge hesitancy on the part of the White House uh, to make testing capacity available for the country. And um, 
and that's why it just seems so disconnected from reality. Like, what do you mean we can't run a PCR? Like, I'm a doctor. I've like, I know what tests we order. Like, we never, we never run into like these kinds of problems, right? And and I know it's a novel virus and all of that, but I can test whatever I want. What's that? I like I can't get a creatinine. Right, right. right. Like, if, imagine if people are like only four creatinines for the hospital today. You'd be like, what? I don't buy that. It doesn't make any sense. And I know it's not the same technology as creatinine, but like just in general, it never made sense to me. And it, and my intuition as, as a clinician and as a public health person was, there is a broader story here. And I think we have come to realize over time there was a broader story. Um, but I banged on it because I felt like we couldn't do anything else uh, if we didn't get testing figured out. And, you know, I remember in the days leading up to sort of the national shutdown, uh, I remember somebody called me one day and said, you know, I'm, I'm in where I think they were in like in the Bay Area. And they said, I, I'm going to move my family to Dallas because there are no cases in Dallas. And I said, there are no cases in Dallas because no one's testing in Dallas. But I have no idea if there are no cases in Dallas. Mm -hmm. So even our ability to do anything kind of thoughtful from a policy point of view was limited by the fact that we had no national testing capacity. And have, or have you come to believe that the pathophysiology of that was simply the president not wanting testing because he believed that keeping the numbers down was good politically? Yes. And, that and it was the president and it was much of the political leadership in the White House. Hmm. And I think we have ample evidence at this point that that's what drove much of what happened in February, March, April, May, June, July, and August. And I imagine as you thought about how important testing would be once you discovered how prevalent asymptomatic infection was, that probably turbocharged your interest in it even more. It did. It also made me start thinking hard about, well, what do, I, what do we do? Like, we can't go out and test everybody in America. So what is the testing strategy? And how do we... Uh, and and, and did a, ended up having to do a lot of sort of thinking about that uh, both for governors and for other uh, kind of political leaders on, you know, if, if you did have available testing and, and, and like, how would you deploy them? How would you capture enough asymptomatic people at the critical moments to make, you know, to actually keep the virus levels down in a community is a fundamentally hard question yep. um, and required a lot of kind of broad consultation and reaching out to people um, and really trying to understand this. But it, it, uh, clearly it's not just testing because, uh, I mean, San Francisco has a very, has a terrific Department of Public Health, has world-class contact tracing, is getting in touch with 80% of people that they're trying to get in touch with. That infrastructure doesn't exist in the vast majority of the country. So even if you had enough testing, would we still just hit a wall because of the lack of contact tracing? So there's different models on this. And, you know, and Paul Romer has both written and advocated a lot around this issue, formal, uh, not formal, he is a Nobel laureate in economics. Uh, and his kind of vision has been one of, we do 30 million tests a day, basically 10% of the population tests every day. And that, and there are, depending on how you deploy those 30 million tests a day, let's leave aside that, I don't know how we get to 30 million tests a day. Um, but there are models that if you do that, you can actually bring the pandemic to a, essentially bring the outbreaks to a close. Because if you're testing enough people with enough frequency, um, you're gonna identify people who are infected and they're gonna not go out and infect other people. And while you might miss some chunk of them in that asymptomatic period, they didn't get, you'll, you'll bring down the are not enough that over time. So that's the kind of super aggressive testing. I have always thought of testing as the starting point for the next set of stuff, the tracing, the supportive isolation and you know, it's interesting, right? Because it's not, I've, I spend much more time talking about testing. I do a lot of work on kind of helping states think about how to build up their tracing uh, infrastructure. But from a kind of public communication point of view of what everybody wants to talk about, what Americans feel most acutely is their inability to get a test quickly, effectively with a result back in a, in a timely fashion. So that's what the journalists are always calling about, right? They always want to talk about the testing part of that. And is this and it is the beginning. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it seems like it's exploded in the last couple of weeks. It's not the testing capacity went down. It's just that as the virus became more widespread, the demand for tests went up. Is that right? Or it actually has the capacity gone down at the same time? So we're doing fewer tests now than we were uh, two weeks ago as a nation. And, and that's because our testing infrastructure was never intended to do the kinds of tests that were number of tests we're doing right now. 
And so it's really buckling under that pressure. You know, machines are starting to break down and uh, reagents are starting to run out. Uh, we've kind of just overheated this system. And, and um, so it's less effective now than it was two weeks ago. And there's a new thread here. I know uh, Michael Mina from your place is promoting it. We talked about it last week in Grand Rounds that we may be letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. We should be aiming for faster, cheaper tests that may not be quite as sensitive, but will pick up people that are infectious, might miss a few people that are less infectious. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of that idea and, uh, and wrote a piece about this as well. And uh, it's one of those things where I've been sort of advocating for it and thinking about it without having really good data. And then Michael Minna's piece, um, he both talked about it, but then has a really nice modeling study that shows that even at 70% at sensitivity, frequently enough in the right populations, and you can probably uh, bring the R-naught uh, uh, under one, obviously assuming that people who get poor positive then isolate and don't go out and infect other people. And, um, and that's clearly where the train is going. So a lot of the work that I've been involved in in the last month has been about trying to get both states and the nation to shift away from PCR as our primary source of testing, just realizing that in March, if we had made a commitment to building up our PCR infrastructure, uh, we could do millions of tests on PCR, but we just can't. We've kind of, that train has left the station. So now we're trying to think about how do we get ubiquitous antigen testing and, and next generation genomic sequencing and CRISPR and all the other stuff. Um, and I also just don't worry as much about sensitivity and think, um, got to think less as a doctor and more as a public health person. I'm not trying to diagnose the disease in a person. I'm trying to identify disease in a population. And therefore, I can live with a lower sensitivity test. And so getting to that place is that the technology is such that that's just a matter of national will and funding? Yeah. And um, yes, yeah. so we have the technology. I mean, the sensitivity of the two antigen tests that have gotten approval are depending on who you ask, the companies say it's 85 plus percent. Some people say it's more like 70, 75. Even that is a funny question, right? Because as you brought up in your initial question, it's about when you test people. So you test somebody when they're in infected, but not infectious, you're more likely to miss them. When they're infectious, they have much more virus uh, and you're less likely to miss them. So um, the, the, those two, plus a whole bunch of other companies that have products, uh, they're there and they could scale up. And if we just let them scale up in normal terms, uh, they can deliver the testing capacity our country needs in about six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want it faster. Obviously, we all need it faster. And so the new strategy has been the White House is not going to help here. So can we get groups of states to band together to send both a market signal of if you build it faster, go out and get a bunch of capital from the capital markets. We promise we'll pay for it. That could help speed things up. And other states are working directly with some of these manufacturers to try to reduce the uh, regulatory burden and, and stuff that no, in under normal circumstances, you'd wanna go through those regulatory processes. But maybe under a national emergency, we could move faster. So one of our viewers uh, wanted you to complete your sentence on the CDC. I didn't let you. So you, you gave the diagnosis, but not the pathophysiology. Why? has the CDC performed so poorly? Um, the people who I think are extraordinary at the CDC are still at the CDC, right? So it hasn't been brain drain. It hasn't been that all the great folks left. They're largely still there. I mean, a couple of people have left, but that's normal. But they're largely still there and they're toiling away. And I see their fingerprints on some of the things that come out. So some of the stuff that CDC releases, I read it and I smile. I'm like, that's the scientists. They're still there. They're doing great work. And then other stuff that comes out of the CDC, you think, oh yeah, this is clearly just a political, uh, a political overlay. It's the, pol the, the poli I mean, there's not supposed to be very many political appointees. There's actually supposed to be just one, uh, Robert Redfield. But the way that they have dealt with the clearance process I've been on calls with state uh, departments of health where the state, uh, the, the, the state rep from, from the CDC is on the call. I'll bring up an issue and I'll actually turn to the state, the CDC person. I'll say, what, what are you guys thinking about this? And they will say to me on the call, I'm not, I'm not allowed to talk about this. I'm like, what are these are national security risks that like China will find out what our strategy is on schools in, in this state. Like, what are we doing here? 
we all know what we're doing here, which is they have largely been told that their advice has to be run through the White House and has really made, made it very difficult. Um, they give, I think, more private advice more freely to states, but, but not so effectively. It's a level of politicization of our public health agency that I think um, I certainly was not expecting, let's say. Uh, so several topics we need to cover. And uh, so we're going to go over probably to about five or 10 after, if that's okay that's with fine. you, Ashish. Great. Um, we haven't talked about the schools. I'm just going to let you riff. So talk about schools. <sighs> like, I feel like I can't win on schools. So, um, so I'm going to take like all the political stuff out for a second, and then I'll bring the political overlay. The way I have thought about schools is I've got three kids, right? And they are, I've got a kid in primary school, second, uh, I got a, like a third, rising third grader, ri rising eighth grader, rising 10th grader. All three of them need to go back to school. Trust me, they all need to go back to school. Um, but have, 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 they, have they called you the worst teacher ever yet? <laughs> you don't want to know what they call me. Uh, not family friendly. Um, no, it's fine. They, they need to go back to school and especially the third grader. And I'm not really talking about my own family, but from a pretty clear evidence, if you look at the National Academy of Medicine, if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, a lot of very smart people, much more expert, thoughtful about this than me, have been very clear, we got to figure out how to get kids back to school. The challenge is how do you get them back safely? And my reading of the literature and my talking to experts as other experts and thinking about this is that if you are in the middle of, if you're in Miami-Dade right now with a lot of cases in the community, it's very hard to bring kids back. And the fundamental issue as I understand it, and as I have described it, is what we know is that the virus spreads effectively when large numbers of people gather indoors for extended periods of time. And that, that's a bar, that's a, a restaurant, that's a gym, it's also a school. Now you can make a pretty big difference in terms of how much spread by getting people to wear masks, which you can do in a school, but you can't in a bar. Um, but it's pretty hard if you do the modeling to have schools open in, in big outbreak areas. And so the, the advice from me and everybody else has been, first, try to bring your virus levels under control. And what is control is where people disagree, but, but fine. And then the second is be creative about, you know, open up windows, have classes outside. Uh, you're not gonna have assembly hall, have classes in the assembly hall, have classes in the cafeteria. Um, do, the, do everything you can to get as much in-person teaching. And if you're in Northern Michigan, like maybe after November, you're not gonna be able to do anything outside. It's gonna get too cold. And maybe you even have to go online, but if you got three months of in-person education, that's pretty fantastic. Let's try to do that. And what has been really interesting, oh, and then by the way, I'm, this, even though the CDC came out and said no testing in schools, not recommended, I actually think we should be doing testing in schools and we should be doing it on an ongoing basis. And I really believe we should do it for kids and uh, teachers and staff. And all of this raises all sorts of logistical challenges, all of which we're working on. And so we've been doing a ton of work with Congress to try to get money. I wish we had gotten this out a month ago for testing for schools, for helping schools improve ventilation, et cetera. And, um, but the, where, what has happened on this is that the politicization of this topic has basically been the following, right? Which is the president comes out and says, open the schools. And a whole bunch of folks essentially then come out and say, open the schools no matter what. And my general feeling on this has been, you get one shot to open the schools. And if you open up when you're not ready and you have large outbreaks and you shut down, you're not opening that school anytime again soon, right? Because people are going to be incredibly gun shy. So please bring the virus levels down, build in a testing infrastructure, open up, the, improve your ventilation, and then try it. And what's interesting is I have, I spend half my time trying to explain why Mississippi should not have opened schools. And then I got into a lot of trouble two nights ago because I wrote a tweet at 11.30 p.m. Lesson to tweeters out there. Think about what time you're tweeting and whether tweeting at 11.30 p.m. is really optimal when you've been up since five. Probably not. I tweeted about New York and how great New York is doing, which it is. It's got 1% positivity rate. And I said, with proper precautions, New York can open public schools. I believe that. And the amount of angry pushback and the people calling me Trumpists 
Um, it's because there's a whole bunch of people who are like, there's no way we're going back to school until there's a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I, think that, I, think that's, I think that's unjustifiable. I think that's immoral for kids and, and teachers. Like, I'm not saying just go back willy nilly. I'm saying if you do your job, we can get kids back to school, especially in low incidence areas. And this is one where the, the, the emotions are running so high that it's very hard for us to have a conversation about this. And it's yeah. frustrating because I think our political leaders have made it this way so that you sort of show your political loyalty by being pro or anti opening schools. And it's not a political loyalty, right? It's sure. like loyalty to our kids. Right. And just one last point on this, and I know everybody knows this, but if we don't open schools, the disproportionate right. impact is going to be on poor and minority kids, and it's going to have a huge labor effect, a labor market effect on women. Because we all know whatever we may claim we believe, we all know that women are going to bear the burden of, keep, of, of taking care of kids at home, and it's going to have effects that are going to last years. So these are not trivial decisions that we make. And if we just decide to throw up our hands and not do schools, it's okay, but, but there are going to be large costs of that. So it sounds like you took a lot of incoming for the 1130 tweet. Do you actually regret it? Sounds like it's no, what you believe. That's what I believe. I, you know, it's funny because there are times when I feel like I'm a darling of the left and there are times I feel like I'm hated by the left or whoever. I mean, I'm a, you know, you, you can probably figure out my politics um, by the way I tweet and what I talk, write about. I don't really make it a mystery. Um, but people see the pandemic through the lens of are you on my team or on the other team? And I find that so frustrating because I, like, I'm, I'm just trying to get it right. Like, I, I have not convinced I've gotten it right every time, but in most of these instances, I'm trying to figure out how to get it right. And I see this being, being seen by most people, like hydroxychloroquine, another great example. Like, for a little while, I really just wasn't sure whether hydroxychloroquine was going to be helpful or not. Like, honestly, didn't know. And so for the first while, I was like getting beaten up because I did, I've done a lot of Fox News and a lot of conservative um, and beaten up for like people saying you just, you know, you're, you're, you're thinking kind of, you're, you know, all you guys ever want is like academic, uh, you know, ivory tower guys want randomized trials for everything. We know it saves lives. And then for, for a while after the first couple of trials came out showing it was negative, I tweeted and also publicly said a couple of times, like there's still this area that we don't really know about and hydroxychloroquine might work and we've got to wait for the data. And then the fire from the other side of, oh my God, I can't believe you're a hydroxychloroquine apologist. Like I'm not an apologist for anything. I just want to know if it works. So it's fine most days, but sometimes I just feel like, you know, I could use a friend or two. So Bob, would you be my friend on these things? I will be your friend. I think you're doing great. It's hard. It's really hard. Uh, speaking of hard, let's turn to vaccines. So hopeful, not hopeful, and what do you see as the speed bumps that we're likely to hit? Uh, the president said we'll have one before the election, Bob. I don't know if you caught that, but um, yeah, so we're that done. Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he did. I think he said that today. Yeah. Again, in the in the spirit of things that are not helpful, uh, the president saying we'll have one by November third is not helpful. Um, I am very optimistic about vaccines. I am very optimistic that we will not have one; we will have many in early 2021. And my best guess is, so first of all, we're entering phase three and I always remind people that phase three is the main event. Like phase one and two just lets you play in the main event, but how you did in one and two is not like very strong evidence of how the game will turn out. It's like weak evidence. So I suspect, believe, hope that the vaccines that are entering phase three, many of them uh, will be found to be effective. They may prevent some chunk of infections. I'm more hopeful that they will reduce severity of infections. Uh, and that is gonna be, and the, a lot of these studies may not be adequately powered to find that. So I worry about that. The safety issues, I, I worry about uh, what are we gonna know on, on issues around antibody you know, mediated kind of disease enhancement. That's kind of the thing everybody worries about. But what are the other safety signals? These, uh, these vaccines seem to be pretty reactogenic. A lot of people get fevers. A lot of people get, you know, really sore arms. And it tends to be worse than kind of typical vaccination. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how are people going to react if you see large numbers of people getting sick, even if it's for 48 hours, uh, people are going to worry. 
Uh, so all of that is my way of saying, I think we'll have one. I doubt it's going to be like a one and done. I suspect we'll be for a while getting, you know, maybe getting yearly vaccines and it may not be perfectly protective, but it'll make a big difference. And, and I suspect that next August will be very different than this August uh, in terms of the pandemic. And my general feeling has been that in the, probably December, January, we'll start really getting the level of data that we're going to be comfortable with. And there's going to be a ramp up of production. The problem is that what people are not paying attention to is it's not just about trying to produce hundreds of millions of doses for the United States. Uh, it turns out Europeans are also trying to produce hundreds of millions of doses. It turns out India is trying to produce many, many hundreds of millions of doses. Chinese also want to make hundreds of millions of doses, and so do other people. And so there is a rush for all the supply chain stuff, right? And it's for all the little vials and, the, and, and what people talk about kind of fill and fit, fill finish. And there's a set of supply chain issues. And if we've learned anything about uh, testing, it is that our nation's ability to ramp up often gets tripped up by supply chains. Uh, problem. So I am not confident that we're going to have hundreds of millions of doses ready by January 1st, as Operation Warp Speed has, has promised. But I can imagine millions of doses. I can imagine healthcare workers starting to get vaccinated in December, January, February. And I can imagine much of America getting vaccinated into the late winter, early spring. Um, and there will be all the issues of you know, vaccine hesitancy, and, 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 and that'll also be shaped by who wins the election. So it's gonna be a little complicated, uh, but, but all of that is my way of saying I'm optimistic, but there are plenty of complexities here. And as you think about how masks became politicized and schools became politicized and testing became politicized, how do you think vaccines will be politicized, particularly given there's a path of the uh, Trump wins and there's a path where Biden wins. And so either one gets politicized, but they have slightly different or maybe very different flavors. How do you see that playing out? I mean, the number of people who say to me, I am not taking any vaccine that Donald Trump has supported. I'm like, Donald Trump is not out there making the vaccine. Like the people who are doing it are doing a good job. It's being overseen by Tony Fauci and NIAID and like NIH and Francis Collins. Like these are all people I trust deeply, right? So I, I'm not, so I don't get bent out of shape over it. Uh, but a lot of people are very, very concerned. And that's why you have a large chunk of Americans who are very skeptical about taking a vaccine. My general feeling is we've got to let the data show up. If there are efforts to shortcut things, I don't think there will be, um, then that will create many more difficulties in terms of, of dealing with vaccine hesitancy. I expect 20, 30% of Americans are gonna be deeply hesitant to, to take a vaccine, get a vaccine. Um, almost under any circumstances. But if we can get a majority of Americans to get vaccinated, it'll make a big difference in the disease yeah. dynamic. Do you, uh, I wrote something a week or two ago about you know, that, 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 that our revealed preferences in the United States show that we tolerate a level of death and disability from flu without changing our normal lives. Uh, do you feel like that's accurate, that that's the level, if we can get it down to being actually like the flu as opposed to the, uh, the canard that it is like the flu, that that would allow us to turn back to something resembling normal life? Yeah, and I do. I think the challenge will be that, the, that it'll be so fresh in people's minds of coming out of a, let's say by the time we get a vaccine, we've had 250 or 300,000 deaths, which would actually be better than most models predict. Um, for the first year or two, it'll be hard to, like, that will, that will kind of, um, you know, that'll be fresh on people's minds for a while. And so yeah. we're going to tolerate a lower level of death because we'll have want to reprieve from deaths from COVID. But over time, if we can make it a much less deadly disease, yeah, I think we will be, uh, we'll Great. be looking forward. So, so uh, maybe the last several questions, I'll sort of move off the disease itself and more to its impact on the healthcare system. So talk a little bit about the fault lines that it is exposed in our healthcare system, maybe around disparities, the public health system, maybe health insurance. So what are the main ones that you pay attention to? Yeah, so, so many interesting questions, right? Um, first of all, we've seen this huge economic effect on hospitals, uh, on primary care practices, and you've seen all the kind of writing about that. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting discussions about what do we, how do we think about payment models as we eventually emerge from this pandemic? And I think there's gonna be a lot of, of work there. Uh, 
one of the really interesting things to me is, you know, I, so the reason I was in Switzerland in, in late February was I was doing this project looking and kind of doing a deep dive into health systems of a bunch of other countries and have always believed that, and still believe that there are lots of ways of organizing a healthcare system and you don't have to do it the English way or the German way or the Swiss way. But what's been really interesting to me on this disease is I remember being in, on a call about how do we do strategic testing of, of nursing home uh, healthcare workers. And it got stuck on who was gonna pay for it uh, because a lot of these workers either have, don't have health insurance or they're in high deductible health plans and they can't afford to be paying for tests twice a week if it's hundreds of dollars. And I thought this is, so the, the, the craziness of our healthcare system on high deductible health plans and how we organize things now showing up in our ability to fight a pandemic. And I do think there is going to have to be some amount of uh, reckoning with that because I, you know, I generally think our healthcare system has, has performed admirably in terms of taking care of sick people. But those crazy features that we've all come to learn to live with, if not love, have really tripped us up in some very specific ways. I think one thing has been very clear talking to Republicans and Democrats is a total clarity that we have way underinvested in public health. We haven't really thought about it. We've conflated public health and healthcare delivery, right? So uh, people always talk about, we gotta pay more for health. And what they really mean is healthcare and insurance. And these conflations, we've, we've talked about them and you know the, the kind of standard lines, it's a sick care system, not a healthcare system. And, but the point is that even, and this is not just, this is not a political statement. We've seen political leaders on both sides of the political aisle often raid public health budgets to make the Medicaid budget work or make the uh, healthcare system spending kind of work. And I think that's gonna to have to get rethought very, very substantially because we need much more investment in our public health infrastructure and that looks very different. So I think my sense is that the healthcare system emerges uh, bruised, battered, uh, and ready for a very substantial set of reforms. If we have a President Trump uh, for second term, I'm not sure we're going to get uh, much substantial stuff. I, I can imagine some payment reforms, a bit more towards alternative payment models, a bit stronger push towards some of these kinds of things. I think if we have a President Biden, it's, it is an opportunity for people uh, to really rethink what is our healthcare delivery system going to look like. And, I, and it's not my way of saying we're going to have single payer or not. I don't think single payer would necessarily even solve this, but it's going to be much more substantial what, our, uh, what the changes are going to be to the healthcare delivery system overall. Yeah. What's your take on the findings of disparities in, well, we in COVID and whether it's, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a lot of talk about it, but is it the kind of thing that people talk about and then the things, the epidemics goes away and it gets forgotten. It's not oh, embedded I, I into. I feel like it's. I, I feel like it's different. I feel like it's different this time, and and I understand that that's a risky thing to say. But um, I think between, and these are not unconnected things. Between the incredible disproportionate effect on uh, on Black Americans and in some parts of the country on Latinos um, and Native Americans as well, and I think, for instance, the the the, the murder of, of George Floyd and and the civil unrest and the protests that it set off. Um, is not disconnected from the way this virus has affected uh, African American communities and, and, and other communities of color. So, uh, and you know, there's. I think there has to be a deep dive into what all went wrong and why did we not see it coming? Why did it take so long to respond? Why is it still that most of the you know access to testing, access to these basic things are still disproportionately in certain communities and not others. There's a lot that I think we really have to think through as we come out of this. Um, but I, I see that as part of a broader uh, racial justice agenda that I think our country is gonna have to uh, grapple with in the, in the years to come. And um, I mean, the disparities on this stuff is unbelievable in certain communities where like 20% of the population is black but 70% of people who died are black. Like yeah. just mind boggling, right? And there's a whole set of reasons underneath it. But I think it's been easy to say, well, they're essential workers, there's more comorbidity. But like the next layer down of why are there, is there more comorbidity? And why didn't we know about it? And why wasn't there a policy response to counter that? Those are the harder questions that we have to grapple with. And, and I don't know why I'm, I am optimistic that we will, but I am optimistic that we will. 
that we're not going to just put out our nice statements and then move on. Yeah, I hope you're right. Uh, moving toward the end, uh, it's almost become uh, a cliche to say telemedicine is the thing that will come out of this that truly was transformational, hit a tipping point, would have taken 20 years and took three months. Uh, take that another step. So what does it mean to the way we deliver healthcare that telemedicine has become a thing? I am assuming it's not just that you replace a 15 minute in-person visit with a televisit, but there's something deeper. So how, how do you think that through? Yeah, I, I guess I see it as, um, I think for a long time before this pandemic, um, we all looked at the healthcare delivery system and said, it looks like the healthcare delivery system of the 1960s. I mean, there are more computers at the desk and you know, obviously you've, you've written incredibly thoughtfully and, and deeply about this, but, but a sense that the fundamental question of what is healthcare delivery and how do we do that and how do we deliver healthcare services to people? That question had not really been asked because there was no reason to outside of the world had changed and, but, but it was very hard to in some ways. What, this, what the crisis did between March and, and May and continues to do in some places and will continue to do in others is fundamentally ask us, how do we deliver healthcare services to people? And in a way that we've never had to ask before. And some of it is we can do telemedicine. And so telemedicine, I think, is fine. And it's clearly going to get a boost. And uh, it'll be great. But telemedicine is not going to change, replace the physician visit. It is going to, I think healthcare is going to emerge from this. There are going to be some forces, Bob, that I think are going to want to go back to the old days. And say, we'll do a little extra telemedicine, but everything else goes back. But I don't think that's going to be possible. And I think... Um, having a much more flexible, creative healthcare system that asks how, what is the best way to deliver this service to this person is going to be a much more kind of interesting and tractable question. So I don't know what the system looks like five years from now, but unlike any other time in my life, I will say it was going to look meaningfully different five years from now. And not just because we'll be doing a lot more telemedicine visits. So we will be doing more telemedicine visits. Great. Uh, my last question, I started you off uh, getting you to reflect on your life as a resident at UCSF. I wonder if you could give advice to uh, young people entering the profession of medicine. Now I have a daughter who's a medical student and living through this as her formative years and the way I lived through HIV in my formative years. Sort of uh, what do you think comes out of this for medical training? And then, you know, as you think about the advice you've been given through the years, uh, what would you like to tell them? Wow. Um, so when I reflect on what the last five months have taught me, um, it is that in moments of crisis where nothing that you know sort of feels stable and that you can turn to, you have to have a couple of principles that you can turn to to get you through it. And for me, um, they have certainly one of them has been about trying to stick to science of things. I don't know the right answer to almost any question, but I know how to read, I know how to think, I know how to talk to really smart people, and I know how to synthesize information. And that has been the thing that has gotten me through this, right? So one of the pieces of advice, I think, is um, figuring out what your touchstones are and figuring out how to use them in moments of crisis and sticking with them. Uh, that At least that's what has gotten me through, through a lot of what has felt like difficult times. Um, the second is that there is, I have found there's this incredible hunger that the American public has for honest conversation about things. And people are pretty good at picking up when you're giving them the standard line. And so don't in general give them the standard line, like be honest with people. And, and the, my biggest regrets of the last four months uh, are times when I was not totally honest. And I wasn't dishonest, but I just felt like I should go with this simple message. People are generally ready to hear what you really think. Um, so I think authenticity, openness, having a very clear sense of um, what are your guiding principles and how do you drive those guiding principles um, are the things that get us through moments like this. Um, there's no doubt about it in my mind that, that you know, the medical education, the rest of medical education for Zoe is going to look totally different than it would have if this pandemic had not shown up. 
Um, and I don't know what it is, like how it's going to change, but for all of us, it's going to be about being flexible, watching how the world shifts because of this. This is a transformational moment for our society in a way that like nothing has happened. And one of the things that I think we learned from the, the 1918 flu pandemic and, and your great interview um, is that these things change society in very dramatic ways for years to come. And only in retrospect can you kind of draw the dots back to the event. And that is going to happen with this as well. Um, but we also get to shape a lot of that. And so what I would do is encourage the residents and medical students and other trainees is think about how you want to use this moment to shape the society we want to live in. And then use authenticity and science and evidence to try to drive those changes. That's a great note to end on. So Ashish, thank you. You are a national treasure. You're really making a huge difference in this. I uh, really am grateful to you. And I know how hard it is to do what you've been doing. So thank you. And very it's proud to have you as a member of our family. Uh, keep up the great work and good luck with the new job. Thank you. So let us, uh, let us say goodbye and thank all of you for sticking with us. Still about 900 people on. Uh, thanks to our crack production team here. We will do the next two weeks August 13th and 20th, we'll do COVID uh, grand rounds. And then uh, we are going to toggle back to some non-COVID topics for grand rounds. So for the foreseeable future, we'll start doing these about every other week and I'll let people know what the schedule will be. But uh, there is, uh, there's other things in medicine that we need to cover as well. So next two weeks, August 13th and 20th will be COVID. Uh, the two weeks after that will be non-COVID and then September will start alternating weeks. Thanks again to our team. Thank you, Ashish and uh, stay well, everybody. We'll see you next week.